Brian Foster here. We're on the Facebook group, Spiritism and the Spirit World Around Us. And we are talking about near-death experiences. And these come from, the one that I'm talking about tonight, it comes from my death, what, by my book, not my death. Uh, what really happens during near-death experiences according to spiritism so what it does it tells you the background story when people have near-death experiences why are they feeling what, what you know what they are feeling how can they explain what's happening to them spiritism explains it and this tonight is a very interesting one and we're talking about the nde of michael where it's the spirit world actually showed him alternative futures so let's get right into it. Again, my book is available. What really happens during death, near death experiences, according to Spiritism? You can go to my site, www.nwspiritism.com, and you can look at all my books on the right hand side. So let's get into it. So, so Michael, <clears throat> Michael's near-death experience was extremely interesting and it was interesting the fact is it i think it really showed you the 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 computing power the information available to to the spirit world because he was able they actually showed him you know alternative futures and how you know we can see that in movies but again how long does it take a movie to to create the scenes and put the people in the right places and everything else i mean it, it takes you know a year or two to make uh, a movie like that with all the special effects thinking about what you know knowing what people think etc and that's why i really wanted to tonight to, to say to talk about michael's nde and he had one of the most complete ndes that i have ever seen and fortunately he was able to retain memory many memories from his experience. His revelations of the spirit world are fascinating. And I'll take you through Michael's experience and relate what the spirit world is actually doing. Now, his NDE was a result of a terrible accident when he was a young man. He talked to the spirits, he looked at alternative futures, and he was told of upcoming events. You can read the whole story of Michael's NDE, NDE at NDERF. Uh, Near Death Experience Research Foundation.org website. Again, that is N D E R F.org. If you're interested in more NDEs, they've got loads of them there. It's a really great uh, uh, website. So let's start. He had an accident. Michael was climbing on limestone cliffs on a frozen day when part of the boulder he was hanging onto suddenly broke free. He and the large rock both fell, with the boulder landing on top of him. According to Michael's recollection, the stone weighed four to 500 pounds, and he felt that he left his body and seeing himself, he knew he was dead. Next, Michael encounters his spirit guide. So that was pretty fast, right? He was like kicked right out of his body. This is what Michael uh, wrote about his NDE. He told me this was an accident and I could go back. Now, first, let's stop right there. This was an accident. So I think... You know, some spiritists say 100% of, of things that happen to us are all planned. I always thought it was less. I think this could be, I could be wrong, I think this could be one of the accidents, one of the unplanned. Here's Michael, and I, and if you look at this whole NDE, and it shows that he had a life plan, but then they had to change it a bit for him to go back. So I think there are some things that are indeed uh, chaotic accidents. Not many maybe one, 2%, maybe 5%. But I think this is one of the things that make me uh, question if everything happens to us 100%. I don't think so, but everyone can make up their own mind. So let me go on. He said, he told me this was an accident and I could go back if I wanted. I told him by my thoughts, there's no way to make that body work. It was squashed flat. He basically told me that he could make it work again. Did I want to go back? I wanted to know my options. What would happen if I chose to go back and what would happen if I didn't? No sooner did I think these thoughts and boom, I was hit with a package of images. It showed in brief what would happen if I didn't go back. I saw my sister get into alcohol and drugs and her life spin out of control because I wasn't there. 
I saw my dad commit suicide because of my death shortly after my mom divorced him over the matter of my death. I saw my paternal grandfather wither away and die, his heart broken over my death and my dad's suicide. There were twin blows that destroyed all the joy he had left in life. The effects went on and on. My mom was sad and heartbroken and the rest of her life so very lonely. And I saw a parade of faces of people I would never meet and whose lives I would have impacted and whose lives would have impacted mine. But now I would never know any of them and they would never know me. The man in the white robe had me with my sister. I always loved my little sister and for her alone, I would have chosen to come back. But seeing all that pain it would cause everyone else, mom, dad, grandparents, friends, cousins, aunts, uncles, man, I had to go back. So imagine that. Imagine you're squashed by a boulder. And you say, okay, what are my options? And boom. I mean, that was all like immediately. So it shows you how time and spirits tell us this, that, you know, time moves much more slowly uh, or, the, you know, Time, time doesn't it, it actually exist in the spirit world. So therefore, they can speed up or, or slow down time for a spirit that goes back, and they can put them back in, in their body. So he could, he could be seen. In fact, I, I will later on do an NDE about a person who felt he was 2,500 years in the spirit world. So, but I also imagine all this data. He, he saw, you know, he saw the alternative future, what would happen for his sister his mother his father his grandfather how all the people you would meet so think of, of the multitude you know gigabytes is not any it's not even beginning to say of how that would be and how would they do all these monte carlo you know effects of different you know simulations of how his life would be and how would they know a sis, you know sister would would you know be in bed you know be in drugs and his father you know would commit suicide how do they know all that? And it's just, I think the only thing you can see is that this has just immense power in the spirit world. Now, also, M Michael's spirit guide, or guardian angel, as many people call it, was right there in an instant. People who have had NDEs recognize that we live close to the spirit world. Spirits are all around us, watching, guiding, and trying to lead us to become better souls. But for most of us, the thought that spirits are at worst goals, right, inhabit the same space is a primitive emotion and should be discarded. Otherwise, we would demonstrate to the world our ignorance and nativity. But what if these uncivilized people who live closer to nature and by no choice of their own possess little material goods detected the truth about our sphere and the spirit realm that we have lost? Could we, who must be presented with absolute proof of everything, be missing something important right before our eyes. An alternative future was shown to Michael. How could this be? Now, Alan Kardec in his The Spirits book, which is a great book, I recommend everybody get that book and get it on PDF, describes the power of a high spirit. He likens it to us here on earth, walking through a trail in a canyon, not knowing what the next bend will look like, whereas the spirit sitting on top of the mountain sees our path where it will lead and other paths that may be offered to us. Still, this is easy to say, but how could this be in practice? What type of instantaneous mathematical calculations or probability combined with moving pictures of these possibilities must be processed to present in a lifelike simulation a series of future options? Really, I have no clue, but imagining how this could be done may be a worthwhile pursuit. It's all, you know, it's all in the data. And we're told, you know, even when before Michael had this, right, every we are told by the spirit world, all of our thoughts are recorded. They all go to the universal cloud. So they can bring back anything they need to, what we think, what our friends think, what we thought at a certain date and time and when we were like with five friends, what they all thought on that same time and what they thought about us as we talked to them. It's all there. Now, he also described, he said, the man in the white robe. And again, this person probably was a little bit brighter, right? And that's a typical thing of what the spiritism tells us. These people appear brighter because they're higher spiritual quality and they reflect the love going through 
the, uh, the spirit world and it reflects off of them and they look a little bit fuzzy for us who aren't on the same level. So next he showed them, okay, what will happen if you return to his physical body? Then, this is what Michael said, then came a second package of images, those of what would happen if I went back. I skipped over the obvious. Dad didn't commit suicide. My sister turned out okay. Mom ended up happy. My grandfather went on the beam with pride over his first grandson to attend a university. My grandfather was a legal immigrant from Italy who never made it past the fourth grade, and he treasured education beyond everything. He crowed like a proud rooster when his first kids graduated from high school, and I became the first of his grandkids to attend a prestigious university. But what I focus on in the second package was what I would pay as a price for going back. I knew that I would walk again, that I had lost would be restored, but only temporarily. In later life, perhaps 10 to 15 years after the accident, I would suffer pain, extreme pain, and it would affect me the rest of my life. So he's made a great sacrifice. He will be one of those poor people in constant pain. I'll carry on. I chose to come back. He smiled as if he knew I would pick the harder path because of how I, how I felt for my family and friends. There was a snap and a pop and I was back in my body. It was filled with crackling electricity like sounds and feelings. I had no breath, no air, and this huge rock was choking up all air. I grabbed the small end of the tear near my nose with one free left hand. My right arm was pinned under the rock and rolled the thing off me like it was made of paper mache. The spirit world gave him actually extra power. So Michael's paraspirit, which is that covering of us, right? We're, we're part of a spirit, a paraspirit, and a physical body. And that paraspirit connects and, and actually covers our, our whole body like an invisible di diving suit. And then it connects to the spirit brain, right? So his paraspirit was reattached to his broken body. And from the second option presented, one can see how positive influences have far-reaching and significant effects on other people's lives. We should never underestimate our power to help other people. Who knows how many intersections you have with other people that you actually made a difference in their life. And this is why if you ever have any friends, even contemplating suicide, tell them you don't know who you're going to interact with. You could be saving two, three, five, ten other people and you don't even know it. It's everything that was planned out by the spirit world for you to help to affect other people is all going to be destroyed. It's not just you you're hurting. And it's not just your family you're hurting. It's everyone who intersects with you in the future. It's a big decision. So, and also, while things may appear to us to be small and unimportant, one never knows how our action can be translated into helping or harming another person's life and relations of that person. So Michael was next transported to the hospital where he experienced his second phase of the near-death experience. This is what he said. The next thing I know, I'm back in the operating room where the surgeon is working frantically to save my life. And as he works at massaging my heart, I found myself drifting away, and the further I drifted, the darker the room got, and the further away his voice sounded. Found myself well above the operating theater, where I should have been on a floor above that room, or look outside looking on a roof. But I wasn't. Instead, I was floating in the entrance to a tunnel or vortex. I was sucked into it, and then that's when my adventure really began. I ended up with a life review and was escorted around the other side, by a being who was my guardian angel teacher, whom I came to call Professor. But he had an incredible sense of humor. I say he with the tongue in cheek because he was neither a he nor she. Now again, I think he said that because he couldn't, because he could not really focus on that. At that probably level of his, who his guardian angel was, his probably wasn't that high. It probably was still in a male or female uh, figure, but he couldn't tell, right? Because it probably was pretty fuzzy. Now, what he says next, I saw what happened, the true atheist. Apparently, I was open-minded enough that I didn't qualify. 
I got to see various heavens and asked to see what hell was like if there was one. And there was, but it was nothing like I expected. I even asked to meet Jesus and, and, apologize, and apologize only to meet a man that was nothing like I expected and was given in, interesting historical facts I was later, later able to verify. But all of this is far too complex here, including numerous predictions of the future that all have come true except one, which I think is yet to happen. So he wouldn't tell us too much about what the future was. So it's interesting. So he, he said he saw hell, but it wasn't like I expected. So what do most people expect hell to be like? Most people is, is you know, uh, you know, brimstone and fire and smoke and the guy with the, the trident and the horns, you know, with the devil. No, hell, there's different parts in hell. Some parts of hell is really frightening. But if you read the books, uh, you know, spiritual literature, hell is like, you know, when we say earth is like heaven, less perfect. Well, hell is like earth, even less perfect than earth, even lesser. Hell is where, and, and I shouldn't say hell, it's called the lower zone or the dark abyss, is where people who do not get into heaven because they are either too materialistic or they had you know, criminal attitudes. So imagine what a city would be like if all there was there were people who took advantage of other people and people who were never nice to you didn't help each other, right? If there was no community feeling, if there was no charity, fraternity, love, honesty, and said there was envy, you know, hatred, thirst for revenge, sarcasm all the time, that's, and even so in those hells, right, which Michael says, they're organized still. There's not just a bunch of people wandering around like zombies. No, they have cities. There's actually factories that make things there, and they actually trade with other cities, and they trade people. They have slavery. If you're a, a weak person and you go into one of those things, they'll take you right away and, and make you start working. So that's probably what he saw. Now, he doesn't say what he saw, but that's my guess. So Michael's guardian angel gave him the complete tour right michael was gifted with a life review so in the future he would know what type of actions stand out in either good or bad light and people with ndes are extremely lucky to have the opportunity to have their tests graded before the end of their allotted time so they can improve in the second half of their exam and as a, according to various books psychograph by francisco c xavier and inspired by the spirit andre Luis. When true atheists die, meaning those who absolutely expect to never wake up again, what unfortunately happens is they don't wake up. Because, you know, a lot is a lot of spiritualists, not just spirits, to say, you know, you you start thinking you're heaven and you kind of go toward that, right? Although there's variations of, of that. Let me just kind of go through what happens with atheists first, and I'll get into what we're able to change in heaven with our state of mind. So if someone's truly an atheist and says, I don't believe in the spirit world, and when I die, I just go back into the ground. So, and they could be a great person, and they could, hopefully, if they had, had any belief, they could be in heaven, right? It's You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to have any religion. You just have to be, you know, live by the golden rule. Unfortunately, if they think they're going to sleep forever, what they do is they exist in a sleep-like state. And so in sense, our thoughts, our actions in the spirit world, that happens. But what happens, though, is the help from the spirit world is with time and assistance from helpful spirits. They, they do passes on them and they help them. These souls are, souls are stirred to life and made ready for their time in the spirit world. Now, Michael's description of various heavens is correct. There are different levels of heaven. And I go into this a lot in my book, Heaven and Below. I have a series of three books, Heaven and Below, Spirits in the Spirit Universe, and How We Are Guided by Spirits. I suggest you read that to really understand the different levels of heavens and the wonderments that occur in how we go from one level to another. So what he what is happening is as we become pure spirits, there are places reserved for various levels of spirits. In fact, the whole universe is filled with colonies of spirits, each one 
according to the law of affinity, whereby spirits have attained similar inclinations gather together. Now, as to what Michael termed hell, he may have been in one of the locations where spirits who have committed crimes are assembled, again, caused by the law of affinity. And I've heard one of these places described as appearing like an Asian city about 150 years ago, somewhat dirty, slaves pulling cart, and the feelings of violence in the air. So let's talk about this. And so let's finish off the atheists first, the ones who sleep. So since they think they're going to sleep, they sleep. And then they have to be slowly massaged back so they, they wake up. So a lot of spiritualists say, you know, we create our own heaven when we pass over. And there is some truth to that. But what happens is you, the law of affinity, places where other spirits are like you. And since your thoughts interact with everyone else's thoughts, you, become, you begin to have a common view of the level of heaven you're at. And also a lot of that level of heaven is in, you know, has been created and imposed by higher level spirits. So of course that affects your thinking, right? When you die, you're, you're not just a complete island of, of thoughts. Even here on earth, we have other thoughts go through our brain and we suddenly feel that we may not uh, consciously, but we, we do, we do hear their thoughts in our subconscious. So, you don't create your own heaven per se, or your own hell. You go to where other people are like you, and then you, you create a, a common uh, environment, a common outlook. Actually, I did a YouTube video on this is in, in explaining this even further. You can find that on my YouTube channel. So... Now, in, as to the lower zone below, yes, those are, I've heard lots of descriptions of those. There's like no paint in the buildings. There's no children, right? Children don't ever go to those places. Uh, everyone uh, is, a lot of them are very horrible looking because they, they feel horrible and then they are hor horrible looking. Now, I'm not sure if to themselves they look horrible or that is from, higher spirits look at them and they see them how they think of, of themselves. So that I'm not sure about. So instead of also down to the, the deep abyss, the alternate site Michael could have been shown, could have just been the lower zone where spirits who are tied to earth still wander. A lot of them are not, not that criminal. They, they, you know, they're not evil. They're more ignorant, right? They're, they just never increase their spirituality or they've just been totally connected to uh, the earth, right? They're tied to earth very tightly and they don't know of anything else. And of course, the lower zone starts, you know, where the earth, the crust of the earth, and it goes up to the beginning level of heavens. So, now the other thing you may say is that, okay, there's beginning levels of heaven and, there's, and, and heaven has these cities and territories, but I look up in the air and there's nothing there. Well, Yes, you're right. In your, in your physical universe, we see space, right? Our telescopes see the stars and the moon. We don't see anything with heavens. That's because it's completely in a different dimension, right? We don't see that. Uh, I remember when I was reading the spirits book and I said, well, yeah, there's spirits on all sorts of planets. There's, there's, there's spirits, you know, there's spirits on Mars. I said, well, there's nobody on Mars, but again, there actually could be physical people on Mars, but in a different dimension. In fact, I, in later books I was reading, when we become a planet of regeneration, that means we move from a planet of atonement to a planet of regeneration where the, the more ignorant, uh, you know, backward spirits, they won't come with us. We will, we will live on this planet without ignorant spirits in the lower zone or the dark abyss that will all be gone that's what that will be when the earth is a much nicer more benevolent happy place so so let's go <clears throat> excuse me so let's go as talking about michael's future so high level of spirits have knowledge of the future and michael was told of certain events that would happen and he said they did now, all foretold events, except one, which may have occurred, have transpired, is what he said. 
Now, others may read this and think just coincidences, right? Michael's brain was shutting down, and somehow he thought images in his mind told him all that he wrote. But ask yourself, how could he have known the future? Yes, he could have in his imagination, visited heaven, have conversations with spirits, experienced many other sensations. But he was given concrete happenings, right? Just like my wife, the reason I found spiritism. She was given in her NDE, things would happen in the future. And usually, she didn't have as good as memories, Michael. Usually she would she would go after the fact, not always. She go, oh yeah, I remember that. And that's why I never really believed it until she remembered like nine months before something would happen. And I, I didn't believe it. And uh, it was big. And, was, uh, and I, that's when I thought, okay, uh, if, if the future can be written, then my whole idea of a far and distant God who doesn't really care about us here on earth is completely wrong. And I always thought, oh, anybody who believed in predestination or spirits, you know, oh, you know, they're just, you know, using religion as a crutch, right? And then, of course, you know, I found myself, you know, having, having to change my whole attitude. And it's, it's, it, it makes me feel a lot better. I, I, uh, I understand why I'm on earth now. I understand why bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people because every, the past lives has a lot to do with what's happening to them now. So there were some other interesting comments made by Michael in his report. At the end of the description of an NDE, there's a series of questions posed to the person who is reporting the event. And this is, here's the question and I'll read the answer. That's why it's a good site, nderf.org site. At what time during the experience were you at your highest level of consciousness and alertness? And his answer was, after I was clear of my body, both times, as I said before, I have an IQ of about 150, genius level, and yet went out of my body in a dead state, I found my, my, myself way smarter comparing the two. I consider myself a drooling moron to what I was outside my limiting body. So this goes exactly what I've said before. No, don't say I, it's what Spiritism has said. When you are pure energy, think of the power of your mind. Think of what you know now and realize that you know nothing. Think of the so-called real world. People say you should acknowledge and think to yourself that they have no clue about the real reality. We are but a physical speck of dust on earth to learn the correct attitudes so the vast, re vast resources of our intellectual ability can be put to good use. I have said this over and over again. We're not on earth to become an intellectual giant. In fact, many people who you think, ah, oh, it's not too smart, doesn't have much of a clue. They could just be completely brilliant in the spirit world, but they were, they were, limited in their intelligence for a reason because they must they have maybe used it because they didn't grow enough spiritually so they ratcheted that back that is all set to teach us ways to tear out our primitive emotions and put in more advanced emotions take out the hate and envy and put in the love and fraternity and the other thing is this now michael says I'm a genius, right? I'm 150 IQ. Now, m most of us here, we could never have be that smart on earth, right? We, we just didn't have the physical structure of a brain to allow us to have 150 IQ. But in the spirit world is why everyone was created equally. Now, people may not exercise their intellectual ability because they don't wish to, but if they wanted to, everyone has the equal opportunity if they work hard to be a, a brilliant musician, poet, author, uh, phys physicist, understand the spirit world, be, you know, a leader. If you, you know, you have the ability to round out whatever you want because every spirit is created equally. We are all that we are this personality, this character with equal aptitude to take on intellectual uh, um, hurdles, right? So remember that no matter what you think of yourself, it could be as far as your limitation and your intellectual ability or whatever, 
your musical ability. If you want to be really good and you're interested in that in the spirit world, you can. So lastly, Michael gives an answer to the one of the questions, which I believe how illustrates how we all connect and how God hears our prayers and sees all. The question is, during your experience, did you encounter any specific information, awareness that a mystical universal connection or unity oneness either does or does not exist? Very good question that they ask. His answer was, yes, I experienced that universal connection. We are both part of a great supernatural internet and yet simultaneously separate PCs as well to use an analogy. Michael has said exactly what I have said. And if you've read or you read my book, Heaven and Below, Spirits and Spirit Universe, How We're Guided by Spirits, or my other books, Explore Your Destiny About Heaven, you will know that we are we are a, a personality. We are a logical personality character type, right? With our own unique uh, uniqueness. Yet we are connected to the spirit world. And when he said we are both part of a supernatural internet and separate PCs as well, this goes exactly what higher spirits say, even as we go higher and higher and higher, right? We, what they say is we, as we go higher, we, mel we merge more into the great ocean of sub sublimity. But no matter how great we are, right, or how high we go, even though we go higher and higher into this ocean of, of sublimeness, right? We still are our own unique personality. And us here, spirits, we're just starting out in the first levels of heaven. As you graduate from one level of heaven to the next, you get more connections, just like your iPhone, where you get more apps on your iPhone. You can do more things, right? You can, you can interact with more people. You can bring more information out. You can send information. The same thing with, with us. As we become disciplined and civilized spirits, we are even have more connections with that supernatural internet to use Michael's words. Yet we are still ourselves. We are still our personality. So think about that. You will have tremendous power. You will be like an omnipotent God to other humans. If you came down here with all the power you had as a higher spirit. And this is a spirit lesser than, than Jesus Christ, who is our example of a perfect spirit. So now I believe if you, if you really look at that, you can see why we have to go through training on earth. So do you want someone with that much power, with thought is action and is connected to everything to have, you know, who doesn't have a good character? who is dishonest and mean and vengeful. That's like, that's like a bank opening up their, their server farm to all the hackers say, well, come on in. I hope you guys are going to be okay. We trust you. Well, no, they don't, right? That's why they have a lot of, <laughs> you know, guards and locks and they have software, right? Firewalls and everything to stop that. But when you look at the spirit world, with the law of affinity, you can only you can only uh, you can only uh, uh, get so much information depending upon your level. So, in the book in the realms of mediumship, psychographed by Francisco C. Xavier and inspired by the spirit Emmanuel, the preface of the book written by Emmanuel tells us this: through the sentiments that character characterize their inner life, all individuals emit specific rays and live within the spiritual wave with which they identify themselves. Such truth cannot remain semi-hidden in our sanctuaries of faith. They will radiate from the temples of science like mathematical equations. So, when Michael's describing the concept of the internet, where we all have an IP address, right? A unique identifier, and we're in constant communication with all around us. Our minds are continually transmitting information which the spirit world receives. It goes out through the galaxy and it even comes back to us. Our walking conscious may not be able to decipher the codes, although some people have fleeting moments of intuition that make it through our gross physical filters, right? So 
In summary, Michael's NDE substantiates, independently of the, doc of the doctrine of spiritism, the complex and overwhelming power of the hidden world around us. The Druids called it the other world, for they too knew that we are but temporary casings, housing in an immortal soul. And I believe that Michael's NDE really explains a lot. And this is from his point of view. He had no, in, in his description of NDE, he had no idea the doctrine of spiritism. Many, most people in English speaking world do not know about the doctrine of spiritism. And that's why I would, I would like to urge people to start looking and studying about the doctrine of spiritism. I believe it would help everyone immensely to understand what heaven is like to understand how what is waiting for us and what what we can do to get there so as i said before i would start with my first book heaven and below book one of spiritism the spirit world revealed to an anglican vicar and i talk about the different levels of heaven how people see jesus christ he's the governor of our planet and other planets besides i um in my second book, How We Are Guided by Spirits, where how spirits help us, what their spirit attributes are. I'm sorry, that's our my third book. And in my second book, that's the, the third book is How We Are Guided by Spirits. Talk about the future, where are we going? And then my second book, of course, The Spirits and the Spirits Universe. Again, that's the attributes of spirits, what the power of spirits are, how they graduate from one level of education to the next. And um, and how you you don't just graduate with a piece of paper, you graduate, you get more power. You, it's like you get more apps on your phone, you become more powerful. Now the other piece I think that help you is okay. So this if this if this is waiting for me, how do I get there? Now I cover this in my book, How to Live Inner Peace Through Spiritism, and it goes through a step by step. And these steps aren't my steps; these are steps. Written by the spirit Andre Luis, psychographed by Chico Xavier, of what we need to go through in order to to be grow and mature spiritually. There's 24 steps. They're all they were all stanz, short stanzas in the in a poem. And I say what that stanza means and what the spirit world means by what they said, and then how do we attain it? And I bring in examples from other books and uh, from what other spirits have said of how to attain that uh state because if and again what the spirit world has said over and over again is everything we do here that you know we sacrifice ourselves or we study anything we do to help others and improve ourselves will be repaid a hundredfold in the spirit world then if you're interested in actually talking to someone and and asking questions is go to spiritismstudy.org you can get an appointment with with me or someone else and there's there's you know there's no cost there's no hassle there's no no written test you just you know they'll you make an appointment at your time zone i'll get in for instance for example i'll get an email i'll email you back saying i can talk to you by skype or whatsapp and we'll just talk about your questions and if you want to know what you need to study i can recommend things right again remember uh spiritismstudy.org i'd love to talk to you i have so many great conversations with people and I, you know, I keep learning. And lastly, for if, if you're interested in getting to the headwaters from Alan Kardec, right? He is the codifier of spiritism. He's the one that wrote a thousand and nineteen questions and he didn't accept the answers unless they were verified by multiple multiple mediums in communications with different spirits in different areas. And then he used that and he codified that within the spirits book. You can find all of his books. He's like five main books, uh, mediumship, the gospel, according to spiritism, heaven and hell and uh, Genesis, according to spiritism. You can find all of his books on PDF. You can also go to my website, nwspiritism.com. Click on his picture on the right top hand side. It'll take you to a spiritist uh, bookstore. Or of course you can get them on Amazon. Uh, and and read them that way. However you like to do. I first got into spiritism by reading all of Alan Kardec's books on PDF. And when I read it, it was just revelatory. 
and you know everyone has different ways of learning and that's why i've written my books and i've tried to do in my books is really bring all the spiritualist literature all the way from Allan Kardec in the 1850s, Leon Denis in the late 18, uh, 1800s, early 1900s, the Reverend G. Bao in early 1900s, Chico Xavier, Yvonne Pierre, others in the 20th century, um, in the middle, later 20th century. So it's all there. I would recommend that. Please, uh, I'm going to put this Facebook live stream up to YouTube and BitChute. Please share this this live stream with other people. Uh, comment on it. Go to YouTube or BitChute. Please sign up, subscribe, hit the bell, share that. Give me any comments you'd like. That all helps the algorithm so we can show people what spiritism is about. I think spiritism telling you why, really, why you're on earth. What is the truth of your state on earth? Of Why do you go through the trials you go through? It makes you feel so much better. You understand everything much better. Anyway, I want to say God bless to everyone. God bless.